Hi, and welcome back to Community Hotline. I'm Monica Weitzel, and we're here in Gresham at Metro East Community Media. I'm glad you stayed with us, because now we're going to talk with a group called House Call Providers. It's a group that's new to me, and uh, so along with you, I'm going to learn all about them. Here representing House Call Providers, uh, provide, uh, House Call Providers, if I can get the mm -hmm. words out. Barb Gorman, you are the Communications Specialist, mm -hmm. and uh, Todd Lawrence, the Volunteer Coordinator. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. We're thrilled. Good. I'm glad. House Call Providers has been around for a while, correct? Yes. So tell me a little bit about the history and, and why it got started. Okay. Yeah. Um, House Call Providers was started about 17 years ago by our uh, founder, Dr. Beneth Husted, and um, she really saw a need in the community for treating the patient um, in the home. And what we're talking about here are people who are uh, very sick, have two chronic conditions. So she started out with about um, a couple of patients, which quick, quickly grew to 100 patients, which wow. more phone calls were coming in because the need in the Tri-County area is, is very large for, for this type of primary care in the home. So when you say primary care, it, the, your, uh, the doctors working mm -hmm. in... Doctors, nurse providers. practitioners, right. and physician assistants. They would be the primary care provider. Yes. They, they're not in addition to somebody else's primary no, care provider. No, when you come on to house call providers, you are switching over to our care okay. exclusively. And house calls, I mean, who does house calls? I mean, it, it's right. something that kind of went out the door a long time ago, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's well, not Marcus Welby anymore, you know. Yeah. Well, that's the idea. I remember. Right. The, the, the thought for years and years and years was that uh, you couldn't do house calls because it's too expensive or it's, right. you know, it was this old idea from like you'd see it on Little House in the Prairie, the doc yes. would come to the house or whatever. That's sort of how we saw it. But really for most of history, that was the way medicine was delivered. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason people started going to the doctor's office was that we developed these really large machines Mm -hmm. that you had to go visit. Right, right. Now we live in the era of these small machines. Ah, so things that, are kind of coming right. full mm -hmm. circle here. Mm -hmm. We have the, the ability, the portability to do it, and it really makes sense to do it. And, and we're sort of, people just have been doing it this way because that's what our generation mm -hmm. or the last few generations have sort of always known. Mm -hmm. Wow. But it turns out it's feasible. Yes. And, and you've been doing it for 17 years, though. That's, yes. That's quite a lot. So the, the growth has, has been constant, and, and um, uh, in the last four years, our budget has quadrupled. Wow. Um, but this is a nonprofit. This is a nonprofit. How does that work? Is it well, it works. First, I want to tell you a little bit about our, what our patient. Okay. Um, so this is someone who is, as I mentioned, about 83 years old. We've all seen the person in the um, doctor's office who has taken the medical transportation, who mm -hmm. is asleep in, in the chair. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, when I talk to groups, that I really want to get across is that house call providers is bringing back honor to our elders. We are treating them. We are able to get on top of conditions that they might have by by being really aware of the tests they've had or their past history, we aren't getting the 15 minute knock on the door. They aren't getting the 15 minute knock on the door. We are spending over an hour with the patient um, once a month up to once every six weeks. In their home. In their home. So it's, sort of, it's more of a holistic approach. Would you call it that? I mean, to, I mean, um, I, I mean, as far as your I would definitely say that because one of the benefits of going in the home is looking around, seeing the environment, right, being right. with their caregivers. We, we're, we, we do all that. Okay, let's talk about that a little bit in more depth, but first, you have a video you brought. Okay. I think we should take a look at that now, and after we watch that, I want to I get back to that because I have more questions Great. about that, right. so let's take a look at that video now. Okay. They came to my home at one of the most difficult times in my life, one of the most difficult times in my husband's life. We lived in a home that required you to walk up a full flight of stairs to get to the car. He was incredibly weak from months of chemo and radiation treatments and um, couldn't do it. They kept him home. They made his, his passing, his journey, as easy as it could be and were incredibly gentle with my heart at the same time. All of our patients are homebound. That's the first hurdle they have to go over when they call for services. How are you having difficulty getting to your doctor's office? 
They virtually all have multiple chronic conditions. The median age is 83. That's the median, so half of them are over 83. I feel it's so special and so much of an honor to, be, to help families and the patient themselves be there at the end of their life. So I think that, that that's one of the things that I think is just really great about this job. There are thousands of individuals out there that are homebound. They don't get the care that they need and it does cost our community. Elder care, it's really about function, and you can't really assess an elder's function unless you see them in their own environment. Um, and you can see them a lot more often than, they, than their family will be able to get them out to a doctor's office. That, I think, was his biggest concern, that he was going to have to be somewhere away from his home. They made it possible for him to stay there. They checked on him every day. They, his pain was controlled so that he he was comfortable. I was raised by my grandparents, so they were like parents to me. So when I see an older patient now, it feels like I'm taking care of my grandparents. To be able to see an individual at 90 and, and how much of a rich life that they've lived, you know, and then to be able to care for them at the end of their life is just really, I think, it's an honor. My first patient came to me uh, as a referral from a friend of a friend who had some dementia, but was still with it enough to walk and talk and be very cranky, had refused to leave her house for 10 years. These are your mothers, your fathers, your grandmothers, your grandfathers. These are people that we need to take care of. After just three months, I had over 100 patients and only then began to realize the magnitude of the need. He would joke and laugh with Rebecca when she came. They developed this incredible bond and she was probably the only other person he saw besides me and it was the gift that she brought to him in her kind and, and caring and, and listening to him and learning about him and how he, it, it was amazing. From the beginning, part of our mission was not to refuse services to anyone for inability to pay and we still honor that. As a result, almost half our patients are below the poverty level. From the time we added our hospice three years ago, we have risen from about 30 staff to almost 80 just over the past four years. The population is aging, more people are living to be old, and many of those people have multiple chronic conditions. I think that the office-based system of delivery of primary care is not really viable for a patient population that is having such great difficulty going to a doctor's office. Not everybody can get out and go to a doctor. Elderly, people like my husband who were too weak to get up and go, I will never be able to repay them for what they did for Billy and for me and if any little thing I could do that would be helpful for them, I am happy, happy to do. That was really moving. You can tell that the people, people can really care, don't they? Yes. Yeah. Very much. It's, it's a very um, personal service mm -hmm. that you're providing. You know, yeah. obviously our, our population is aging, you know, the baby boomers are all getting mm -hmm. older and, and I can see where there would be a huge need for this. And I know having um, ha elderly parents, and I, I just lost my mother a couple months ago, and mm -hmm. how difficult it was getting her to her appointments. You know, I, was, right. I was the one who took her to her appointments, that meant time off you know, of work for me, and I didn't mind doing it. I, you know, mm -hmm. love to do it for mom, but it meant time off from work, arranging for medical transport because I was not able to transport yes. her in my car. Yes. You know, getting to the doctor's office, you know, sometimes you're there and you need to go to the bathroom, so it's hard to get them to the public mm -hmm. restrooms. It's just mm -hmm. all those little it, things. It's the ripple effect of house call providers. We're not only helping the patient, we're helping the, the family yes. too, to know yes. that, your, that your loved one is getting this kind of care. Right, right. right. Yeah. You know, for the, the, I think as a society we're grappling with this idea of how families have spread out.
Mm -hmm. Just this morning, yes. I my sister had uh, come into town for her for a visit. It's the first time I've seen her in a few years. I just dropped off at the airport. She got on an airplane to meet my parents in another state, mm. and I think a lot of us have had experiences sure. like that where we're not families aren't close anymore, and right. and and then even when they are, like you had then just what it takes for one person to be that caregiver, that oh, yeah. person. Yeah. So many of us have had that, that I mean, that experience of, of managing some t a, a long period of time. And with the people we have who are homebound and disabled often many, many years before the end of life. Right, right. <laughs> they're stretched to the, to the, yeah. uh, you to know. The, yeah, to right. the limit, because being mm -hmm. a care provider is a very difficult, difficult right. job. Yes. I know I, um, I, I was fortunate I had two sisters who lived here, and, and my mother actually lived in a, in, a, in a really wonderful place where they took great care of her, but, mm -hmm. you know, my sisters and I were very involved in, uh, but a friend of mine just visited from Arizona, and he's, he has two elderly parents who are mm -hmm. pretty much homebound, and mm -hmm. he is their only child, and he's like, you know, that's his whole life now, pretty yes. much right. is taking care of them, and that's really, really difficult. It's mm -hmm. hard to, it's hard to, you know, find a life outside of that. So that gives them a, a real, a real respite from the, right. from that. The, well, I was going to say the other side of that is, is that people often skip their appointments to the doctors when. Uh, it's hard to get to them. Yeah, sure. And sure. then so and they don't end up until they get into the in, seeing a doctor till they get to the emergency room, mm -hmm. uh, and and so that's a, so a, the emergency room becomes their primary care. Right, right. which is not and that's not that's not an ideal situation. Absolutely. And when you think that there are three to four million homebound Americans wow. ac across the United yeah. States, right now we're involved in something that's really exciting. We're in just finished year one of a national demonstration project called Independence at Home. And Independence at Home, um, we're uh, one of the sites along with um, 15 other sites and three consortia that is testing out one, um, a Medicare um, payment model that would reward sites or practices that are saving money by delivering this type of care. Really? Yes. And we're really excited about uh, what that could mean for this population sure. because um, to, uh, the reason that people aren't doing it is they can't, the, the reimbursements are too low. Uh -huh. So if Medicare, which as we all know needs a little help, uh -huh. um, can save money and um, uh, this type of care, they call it the triple aim, better care, better health at a lower cost. Health call providers like has saved. Yeah, yeah, health call providers has saved millions and millions wow. of dollars by giving better care. It makes sense. Senator Ron Wyden, as you saw in the video, he was um, one of the sponsors of the bill. This is attached to the Affordable Care Act, and um, just we're just really excited to see how, what will come. That's right. great news. So I hope I hope it all works out because that that sounds like a great plan. Yeah. You know the. Um, I like the idea of the house call providers going to the house and being aware of the of the surroundings mm -hmm. of the patient because I mean tell me about about that you've probably have you have you made those calls yourself have you been to patients homes I will yeah. defer to my yeah, yeah. And so yeah. what, what kinds of things have you seen that 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 have you know that you've been aware of that you've been able to point out or take care sure. of for somebody well I mean it, th that's a huge question and a huge <laughs> subject I mean we see all sorts of things, and it's interesting because a lot of times when I first encounter these people, they're a, a sheet of paper. Sure, you sure. Know, they start you know, out as a number or right, just and, a name. Or, and I get, you know, a little bit about the case, and, and um, invariably, you know, when I go to meet them, uh, their whole world, you know, like, I mean, I don't see every part of the world, but, but they become so much more than that paper. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. And I think that a lot of times when doctors see us in, in, in sort of the impersonal, we go to their place, we walk in and we're just a person who walks in, there there's no context. Yeah. yeah. What yes. I, you know. You, you see where they live and, and if they have pets and it, what the state yeah. of their home is and mm -hmm. if they're very dirt poor or if they're mm -hmm. actually in pretty good shape, all those kinds of things. Yeah, you see How the, they eat, perhaps, the pictures on their thing. wall tell you so much. Yeah. Who loves them? Who's, oh. Who they love? What their life is about? And I mean, as volunteer coordinator, my job in a, a lot of cases is bringing people to them and trying to to uh, bring some, you know, if you bring everything to someone who's homebound, it's great to do that because they they really can't get out for themselves a lot of times, but you also run the risk of isolating them. So sure, one sure. of the other things you have to bring is you have to bring some community uh, to them. 
So, so tell me about the volunteers. Yeah. What, what exactly do the volunteers do at House Call Providers? There's a lot of things. So one of the things they do is, is companion visits. Oh, great. And so b basically going in and spending an hour of time with someone in your neighborhood. And one of the reasons we're here today is to try and get the word out beyond the three square miles where <laughs> we're, we're, we're sort of known uh -huh. to the entire area mm -hmm. so that people in Gresham or Hillsboro or you know like all mm -hmm. over Gladstone Gl yeah. right all of those places know that there's somebody in their neighborhood somebody who lives mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. a mile from their house that they could go and visit and spend just it's an easy volunteer yeah. assignment in a way you're just going to talk but it means a lot because you know when somebody's especially for the people on hospice but really anyone who's in the situation when you're having that question what does my life mean you're at the end of your life what did it all add up to and, and you're going through that sort of existential, right. those questions. Right. To have that person show up at your house is the most eloquent answer to that question without them saying anything. You matter enough that I came. Oh, that's really, that's really touching, actually. Yeah. And I imagine that what the volunteers get out of it is huge. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, speak for yourself. How, how, you know, have you had some experience where you just... Sure. So I'll, I'll talk about my, uh, the, the person that I first volunteered with was a, a woman named Lisa. And uh, she was uh, uh, wanted, she was, she'd been a writer and she wanted to tell uh, her story. And I came with a, a, a tape recorder uh -huh. and just listened to her story. And she spoke in the most beautiful prose. They don't all... Right, <laughs> you know, sure. But she did. She spoke like a writer. She spoke like a writer, and it was this, like for me, it was like this entry into this world, like that ha that she ha when she was a child, this world that existed forty years before I was born. Wow, it's like having an audio book right there, but yeah. in person. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. And so I got to listen to her, and, and it was amazing. And then afterwards, I had a a volunteer who transcribed uh, for me, and he would come in like to my office with like pages and say, look what she said here, look, you know, I mean, like, he, he was, got something out of it, too. Even yes, just yeah. reading, I mean, it was, so. like, it's amazing, the stories, what you hear from these people, what, you know, they're, it's a world that's gone, mm -hmm. that they and are everybody has a story, don't yes. they? I mean, everybody yes. has a story. Yeah. So, you asked what volunteers do, one thing they do is, is okay. those visits, another thing is respite visits, it's a little longer, but actually allowing the family to get out. Yeah. You can imagine when yeah. you were in the situation right. you were in, like how yeah. hard it is to... Yeah, sometimes you just need a break. And it, and it mm -hmm. gives you, it refreshes you to have that yeah. break so that when you come back to them, you're, you're not worn out and resentful. Because yeah. it, Absolutely. I think it's easy to get resentful. Absolutely. No matter how much you love somebody, you can get resentful mm -hmm. that you're, you know, I'm losing my life. But mm -hmm. having somebody give you a break... Three it's hours a huge can thing. be an eternity. Sure it is. Well, and that's, yeah. again, when I was saying that we haven't, as a society, you know, the fact that people towards, you know, when we hit this portion of our lives, that if our parents are alive, that we spend this much of our time worrying about them, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's, we're all going through that. Every sure, one of us sure. goes mm -hmm. through a version of that. Mm -hmm. And we need better answers. And, and House Call Providers is, is not the answer, but it's a part of the answer, and, and you know I'm proud that we're part of the Portland community, and that that Portland is sort of part of what what might turn out to be sort of a national answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is there, is it, are there other organizations like this around the country? Is this is it typical? We are in the demonstration. We are the only standalone nonprofit. Really, um, I do believe that um, this is becoming a little bit more common but right now I'm, I'm not really sure right now I believe that we are the only um, you, house call nonprofit in right. the state of Oregon right we didn't invent the idea of home care there are other right, great right. home care organizations in the right. area and they do great work and mm -hmm. we should but not them. As a, yeah oh, yeah but they, yeah. they do and right I, I, but what we're doing in terms of this national model and in terms of helping to quantify sort of these the savings for Medicare you know if, we, if you know anything about the history of hospice mm -hmm. you know that there, was, there had to be a demonstration program where they had to find out whether hospice worked. Uh -huh. And now we're sort of in Doing the same, same thing, thing yes. to yeah. find out whether this works. And, mm -hmm. and it potentially could be something that becomes a national mm -hmm. um, thing, at least uh, we, wow. we hope. 
Absolutely. And just to put, um, also just to let your viewers know that we are looking for doctors and nurse practitioners to join, to join us and okay. to join our mission. Yeah. Right. And okay. I invite them to go to our website where they can ride along with one of our nurse practitioners, Amy Long. She was in the video uh -huh. and kind of see what a day, what her day looks like, because this, this isn't for everyone. Right. This is a really, this is a, this is a vocation. I've right. often called yeah, it. Yeah, I can see that. And, see and that. also being a nonprofit. Um, and being part of the development and a fundraiser, I actually have to say that um, donations are welcome. And, I'm sure donations and are always welcome. And the community welcome. has been has been wonderful, wonderful to us, especially in supporting um, our independence at home yeah. participation. Good, good. Now, um, Todd, you mentioned um, volunteers and um, that you know you need a volunteer. You always need volunteers. Yeah. You're going to be doing some trainings soon. I understand. Yeah, in, in August we're going to be holding a training at our office, which is in the Johns Landing area. Okay. And it's going to be on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, I think, starting on uh, the 12th. Uh, th this one is during the daytime. I sometimes do them during the daytime and sometimes in the evenings. But the, the training is a really great place to sort of like have a conversation with other people who are interested and with yourself mm -hmm. about just a subject of what do I have to offer another human being? What can I right, do? Right. A great opportunity for people to have yeah. a little time on their hands and want to and want to make that time more meaningful. Absolutely, yeah. and as we said earlier, we really want to reach out to the to the outlining areas yeah. to get those community members involved. That's great, and, and we're just about out of time. But okay. you, you mentioned you have hospice also, so yes. so people are part of the house. You know, the, the program they can kind of transition into hospice. Absolutely, we right now we have four, about 1400 patients and our hospice only takes our our own patients okay and it's yeah. a it's a really um, w beautiful transition their clinician stays with them mm -hmm. during hospice so uh, a hospice team you can have up to five members in your home and then having the clinician there too so that six people involved in your care and then all the people all the support staff of house call providers the social workers the the care coordinators the administrators we're, we're all so bound together in that mission oh, that it, it's it's really a, a wonderful it's a committed place group well speaking work. of that and the and your employees and staff I understand you're one of the um, top places to work yes you were yes. voted by the Oregonian I yes think? it was uh, the employees that um, that voted from their mm -hmm. comments and Wonderful. we got um, best small workplace. Great. Well, we're out of time and I wish I could talk. Thank I could talk a lot longer. Right. There's a lot more to ask, but thank you both so thank much. Thank you so Barbara much. Thanks for having us. Really oh, appreciate it. It was a pleasure. You. Thanks so much for watching Community Hotline tonight. I hope you enjoyed that segment. I sure, certainly did. And if you're interested in being a volunteer, interested in donating either financially or of your time um, or just to get more information, do go to their website. I'm Monica Weitzel. We're here in Gresham at Metro East Community Media. We'll see you next week on Community Hotline.